All right, hello everyone. Uh, my name is David Ahern, and I'm going to talk about the Linux routing API and specifically some work that was done over the past couple of years to improve scalability with uh, managing routes. Uh, this is something I, this idea of separating next hops out of routes was something I first proposed like two years ago at NetConf in Seoul. And it was based on a proof of concept with IPv4. And it showed really um, great results and how things can be done better. Uh, it has been a very long road to get this work completed and in and into the kernel, most notably due to IPv6 and how radically different its implementation was from IPv4. Um, but I am very happy with the way things ended up. All right, so I will start with a high-level summary of um, the routing changes and the results. Most people don't care about the, the details of how routes are managed in the kernel. I get that. So if you remember nothing else about all, this, all the changes that went in, I hope that this summary will stick. From there, I'll back up and look at the driving use case that motivated um, splitting the next hops out as separate objects. Review the legacy routing API, dive into the new next hop API and what it provides, and then show the, the benefits to it. It's not just about lowering the overhead of managing routes, but it also enables other kinds of features and fixes some pain points that exist for um, like IPv6. All right, with that, so the current API for managing routes in the kernel, it requires all the next hop information. That is, what is the next device, the next gateway, the, you know, the next path, the, the next node in a network path to be combined with the prefix, uh, all that pushed into a single message and sent down to the kernel, okay? So networking paths tend to be redundant. And what this means is the kernel is repeatedly handling and validating information over and over again, the same information over and over again, because to the kernel, each route is separate. So this overhead really appears as the number of paths in the route increases. And so you can see for IPv6 or IPv4, with four paths in the route, the number of prefixes that you can put into the kernel per second drops by 60%. And for IPv6, it drops by 45, it drops down to 45% of that rate. And so the more paths, it's a dramatic decrease in the ability to insert um, routes into the kernel. So this overhead is addressed by splitting out that typically redundant information into a separate object, something that has its own life cycle for creating, updating, destroying, and then having the routes reference that by an ID, okay? It's a very simple concept, but with huge implications on performance. So while, they, while splitting out the next hops as separate objects, you still see a little bit of this tapering. Um, if you come back, you know, I'll show this overlay at the end where the before, this, this next hop intermediate step, because this is a new API. Most processes don't know about this new API. There's gonna be this time window of backwards compatibility. So when notifications are sent to user space, the next hop information is expanded. So there's still a little bit of tapering for both v4 and v6, but the rate at which you can insert things into the kernel has gone up significantly. So from looking at uh, just a single path, IPv4 shows a 30% gain, IPv6 shows a 40% gain, and then when you look down at like 32 paths, it's just it's off the charts, uh, an increase in performance. But more importantly, it allows us potential for constant rate times, right? Which is what the end goal is. It shouldn't, it shouldn't have this um, increasing overhead as you increase the number of paths. And so this is possible once your entire operating system says, I understand the new API, or if it doesn't care, then no change is needed. And then we'll have a, a syscontrol or something that says, we don't need the backwards compatibility just go with the new, the new performance. All right, so with that, let's back up and take a look at the use case that, that really pushed the, the need for this, this new API. So as I mentioned in previous talks, network operating systems are moving to putting more and more information into the kernel, right? So a true Linux-based 
um, network operating system, the kernel is the source of truth, and that's the case for Cumulus Linux. Everything is put into the kernel. Any user space no, uh, applications that are interested in this information have Netlink messaging or Netlink notifications to receive updates as things are, are done. The difference gets into how do you program the hardware. In the case of Cumulus Linux, the hardware programming is done by a user space process. That process is linked to an SDK. As the routing daemon, for example, FRR, pushes routes into the kernel, the user space application gets notification of that. It will map the Linux model onto the hardware model, invoke some SDK functions, and that programs the hardware. So a, a very similar architecture to this is SwitchDev. In this case, you don't have a user space driver, you have an in-kernel driver. You're not relying on user space notifications, you're relying on in-kernel notifications, but still, it's the same architecture, right? You have um, routing daemons such as FRR, pushing information into the kernel, which is the source of truth, and then there's some way to get that information down into the hardware. Take away the hardware, take away the, the offload ASIC, for example, shrink the number of interfaces, and it's really the same kind of architecture that you see for routing on the host, right? When you got virtual machines and containers. And what's of interest is the ability to adapt quickly to any kind of changes in the networking, All right? A similar architecture gets into these, what I would call a hybrid approach, where you don't rely on notifications, be it user space or kernel-based notifications to program hardware. Instead, you could easily have this done through some other mechanism in user space where the routing daemon feeds all this information, or multiple routing daemons could feed this information into some kind of a FIB process, which flattens things out and sends one set to the Linux kernel based on its model and sends another set of commands to the ASIC offload driver, which then programs the hardware. But really, the key point here is you have a large route capacity in either the ASIC or the kernel, for example. You have a very few number of front panel ports. The kernel is the source of truth for all of this, or not necessarily the source of truth, but it contains all the forwarding data um, that's being used. And we're looking at this from not just scalability for today, but scalability for tomorrow. You know, like with routing on the hosts, as the number of CPUs increases, there's more containers, more VMs. Things like Project Calico, bringing L3 down to the host more and more. And then looking at things like SwitchDev and Spectrum ASICs, for, or Spectrum 2, for example, with a million routes. So the key there is that you know, you've got a huge number of prefixes, a few number of um, paths in your network. And so there is a large redundancy in um, the information that the, the routing, that the routes are pointing to. And this redundant information is the source of the overhead. So in some cases, you could have hundreds of thousands of routes all pointing to the same path, be it a single path or a multi-path route. And so every time you push that information to the kernel, it's got to keep getting verified. So. Let's take a look at routing suites. You know, BGP was the one that uh, kind of pushed the, the change that I was, you know, that I made for the next hop information. And the way BGP exchange information, when BGP on one switch appears with another one, uh, the next hop information is a separate attribute in this message, with, along with a list of prefixes, okay? So routing daemons have information separate. It goes to push that information to the kernel. The kernel says, well, my API says I need the prefix along with the device, along with the gateway, and I need that for each path. Combine all that information and push, me, push it down to the kernel. The kernel then has to take a look at that message, and for each one of those next hops, has to validate it. If there's a gateway, does that gateway, if I do a fib lookup on that gateway, does it map to the egress device that was in that message, for example? It'll have to allocate some memory for the, the next hop information. And in, because of cached routes and exceptions, it also has some pCPU, per CPU information that it will get allocated. And then it does some more massaging, like IPv4 will try to consolidate this information, but after it's done the validation, okay? And then that information is then passed to, once it's either put into, the, once it is put into the FIB, 
That information is passed to notifiers, for example, which have to send messages to user space going up or messages down to the switch dev driver going down to the, to the end kernel driver. Okay, so routing daemons, information separate. Kernel requires that information to be pushed together. So before we get to what the ASIC driver has to do, let's look at how the hardware programming has to happen because the Linux model and the hardware model are a little different. So from the hardware perspective, you have these front panel ports. They get represented as net devs in the kernel. But what the hardware wants to see, if you're gonna do L3 forwarding, is you've gotta create a router interface on top of that port. So that router interface is what corresponds to what Linux calls the egress device in the, in the route. You also have to have that net, um, host route. So the gateway, what really matters is the MAC information. So that gateway has to be resolved into a host route and the host route gets programmed in the hardware. Once I have the router interface and the host route, I can create this thing called a next hop, which is, you know, the limited resources of hardware says, let's create this next hop once and have multiple things point to it. If I'm gonna create a, a multipath route, I create a series of those and then I create a next hop group, okay? At that point, I can then program the LPM entry into hardware and then after that, multiple entries can correspond to that same next hop or next hop group. So the kernel has this information integrated. It sends the notification up to user space or down to the kernel. Both of those drivers have to turn around and break that information apart and say, hey, have I already created this next hop in the back end, in the hardware, right? Because it wants to only do it once. It can't, doesn't have the resources to do separate next hops for every route that's getting programmed. So that means the driver has to kind of keep track of this device and gateway or this path corresponds to this hardware entity, okay? So now it's gotta take that integrated kernel information, break it apart, do a search for something unique, and if it doesn't exist, then go and create it. So when we look at this from an end-to-end, -end, from BGP down to programming the hardware, you have a lot of wasted cycles validating repetitive information, okay? And so that was the point of saying, you know, let's, let's break this apart. Why, why can't we have the redundant information as a separate object with its own life cycle, right? So it'll have its own add, create, modify um, set of commands, its own set of attributes for specifying a device and a gateway. And then once that exists, prefixes can be pushed down to the kernel and just point to that next top by an ID, right? So now the validation only becomes, is that ID valid? It's not is this device valid, is the device up, is the carrier up, is the gateway resolved to that device? All that information is done once and now we just point to it by an ID, okay? Very simple idea, but huge ramifications on performance. All right, so the API, like I said, it's its, its own object. So based on the way RT Netlink is done, we've got new RTM commands for adding a next hop, deleting the next hop, updating the next hop, um, retrieving the, getting a dump of what exists in the kernel. And then there's new NHA attributes that go with that. So as usual, things are put into the UAPI directory. Um, I purposely made the NHA, the, the net, next hop attributes, direct parallels to the RTA versions. In fact, most of the, the code changes needed for this feature were on refactoring the core code so that the next hop code and the end kernel, the, the core integrated route APIs, it uses the exact same code on the back end for validation and um, initialization of the end kernel data structures. So there's two kinds of next hops. There's a basic next hop, which is a single path, here's a device, here's a gateway, or that basic next top can be a black hole. You create one or more of those, and then you can create a group based off of that. Um, and of course, all of those have their own ID, so the, the ID is the key reference for next hops. And that ID is definitely unique within a network namespace, 
And that ID can be used by the ASIC drivers then to track, have I seen this before? And have I created this in the back end already? So the kernel allows you to specify an ID. So for example, FRR creates its own IDs for these and tracks it internally. But you don't have to. If you don't want to do the ID management, you can allow the kernel to do it. It has a counter where it keeps track of what was the last assigned ID, and it will find a unique one that is not in use and assign it to that next hop. OK. So my original goal was to not have any address family specific things related with this. The cached routes and the exceptions kind of forced me to make these address family specific. So when you create a basic next hop, you do have to say, is this an AFI net or an AFI net 6, so an IPv4 or an IPv6 next hop. And yeah, so then the gateway is validated based on that address family. OK. So, as it, so to create a multipath, next hop, you would then create one or more basic next hops, and then create a next hop, again, with its own ID, but with a list of references to the individual basic ones. And I purposely wanted to overload the struct next hop to mean either a single path or a multipath, because the core code, when I show some changes later that were done to it, it doesn't really need to care. It simply needs to say, do I have an external object? And we'll let the next hop code itself say um, whether I have a single one that I return or do I need to walk the individual ones. Okay? So it's a way of making the core changes once and then allow features to be done inside of the next hop code. Constraints. You know, we, we always want everything to be un unconstrained and as flexible as possible, but reality kind of kicked in. So for multipath groups, you cannot do nested. You cannot have a multipath next hop group inside of a multipath next hop group. I will come back to that. I do want to allow groups within a group, but that's a different, um, a different style, a different topic. If you're going to have a group with a next hop, I'm sorry, if you're going to have a group with a black hole, then that group can only have one next hop. So the idea there is you cannot have um, a multipath route, one of those is a black hole, the rest of them are normal device gateways, and so some traffic disappears based on the selection. Really the intention there is if you're gonna black hole traffic, you do it all, and then if you want to a, a do an atomic update on prefixes, you know, you can redo that group and have it be something like a more normal device gateway. Uh, the same next hop ID cannot be used more than once within a group, so the kernel has to track um, kind of both backwards and forwards with the this next hop group references this next hop which references this device so that when a device event happens it can go the other direction and say this device disappeared so this next hop disappears so this next hop group needs to get updated and that tracking kind of limited it to um, a single basic next hop can only be in a group one time and the other one is, the other basic constraint is you cannot change the type. So if you create a uh, next hop ID 1 as a basic device gateway next hop, you cannot do an update and try to make ID 1 a group. And that gets into some implementation details about uh, the RCU data and some references to it. I, I didn't want that overhead of having to be able to toggle between the types. From a route perspective, uh, a new attribute was added, RTA NHID. This is how you would tell a particular route entry is using this next hop. You just have to specify the ID for it. If you specify that ID, then you cannot give any other information like the, like the device, the gateway, or any kind of end cap information, because that would then be a duplicate, and we don't want the kernel to have to validate two things. So by having this next hop ID by reference, we get to skip all those validation checks, which is where we get most of our performance from. But we still have to do some basic minimum checks. We have to verify that your ID that you gave is a valid ID for a next hop. We have to make sure that the next hop type is valid for the route. Specifically, we allow v6 next hops with v4 routes, but you cannot have v4 next hops with v6 routes. 
for v4 gateways, use the mapped addressing as a way of, of implementing that. Uh, and then the scope checks for IPv4, you got to make sure that uh, the prefix, if it's a host scope, it then can't have uh, an invalid scope for next hops, things like that. But those are very fast and super minimal from, from a checking. Coexistence of models, Th this is an opt-in API. Um, if you like the old way of doing routes, you don't have to change. But if you're running something at scale and you really want these efficiencies, it's, it's well worth the, the flip. And I have tried to make this as painless as possible. And then as a part of this backwards combat compatibility transition period, um, when notifications are sent to user space, the um, next hop definition, if you've given a next hop ID, it will expand and add the device and the gateway and the end cap information into the user space notification so that existing apps like SNMPD, NTPD, you'd be surprised how many applications listen for route changes and you would wonder why they listen for route changes. Uh, so anyway, those applications will still get that information and then in time when they get all converted, you know, we'll be able to turn that off. All right, so now we're gonna take a little bit of a detour into the kernel side of this, um, kind of give an overview of, of where that code is and some changes that were made. Um, so all of the code, I, I attempted to keep it consolidated into nexthop.c or nexthop.h as much as possible. I wanted the intrusions into the core code to be as minimal as possible. So basically, if route entry has a nexthop by reference, then go to this helper in the .h file or call this function out of the .c file. And the intention there is that when I talk about a feature later, if someone has the time to implement this, they don't have to wade into IPv4 code or IPv6 code. They can consolidate or, or keep their focus on just this next hop code as a way of, of implementing new changes. The next hops are stored in a per network namespace RB tree with that ID as the, the lookup key. Um, again, so a, the majority of the patches to get this feature in was refactoring. Refactoring to get things like fib and h as the primary input to, to functions or the fib6 and h existence and, and into functions. Um, and inside of that, everything relies on some common information, be it a device, be it a gateway address, be it in-cap information, be it um, references to cast routes or, or exceptions. And so anything that was gonna be common across both of the, the layers, I moved into a fib and h common and I tried to get the code to reference that to the greatest degree possible. If you didn't need to know something specific about IPv6, you can use a fib and h common as the, as the input argument. And then the exporting the initialization and release functions for these so that the next top code calls in to, to again, get that same validation across the, the two implementations or two APIs. Struct next top is the basic um, um, structure for this next top information. It has things like a list head for tracking which fib entries are referencing this next top, which, you know, so which ones have a reference to it. So if the next top is deleted, you can very quickly go back to all the fib entries that need to get evicted. Or if a device goes down, which device reference, there's a device hash to know which next hops are using it. So again, to go backwards and be able to evict things in a, in a very quick and sane order. Um, there's a tracking for groups. So next hops that are inside of a group, when the next hop is, disappears, then the group needs to be updated as well. So there's, there's list heads to keep track of that information. So data structures. Um, the primary change was just to come in and add next top star dot h or star nh to both the fib info and the fib6 info. So the fib info for IPv4 is the core data structure for the next hop information, other metadata like the priority, um, toss, um, hash, uh, anyway. Fib info is the primary data structure for four. 
from the refactoring that I did in 2018, I made FIB6 info as much of a parallel to the FIB info as I could for IPv6. It's not exactly the same, but it's as close as I could get based on what I needed to eventually get to, to this. The, for, so, so FIB info and FIB6 info both have a next hop struct, so FIB NH or FIB6 NH, and that's the one that contains the actual data. And so that data structure then becomes part of the next hop. Because when I do a FIB lookup, I ultimately will have a prefix, and I want the next hop information. And so I changed V4 to, on the FIB result, it returns the common, and it doesn't really care. Is it a V4, is it a V6? I don't really care, because what I want is I have an egress device and I have an address. And then later functions that care can do the container of to go from the common to the four or the common to the six. And then from a next hop group perspective, the next hop, a next hop group has a series of references to individual next hops, and then of course those reference um, the FIB6 and H or the FIB and H directly. So IPv6 was hands down the largest pain in the butt to get this done. So the the way multipath was done for IPv6, um, each individual leg was a separate route entry. And then those route entries were linked together through a siblings list. And that the way then the IPv6, IPv6 code was done was, was FIB6 info, RT6 info in the original implementation, um, was a primary data structure that was passed around. And what I need for next hops is something similar to what IPv4 has, which is one pre prefix, so one FIB info or one FIB6 info, references a whole bunch of FIB6 and H's or FIB and H's, right? And so that's the next hop information. And so the majority of this time was spent trying to take that existing IPv6 code, move the things that were move entries into the FIB6 and H when they were relevant to the next hop, refactor the code so that a FIB6 and H was the primary thing that it took to do the operations, and then iterate over. So when, when you're walking the FIB entries, you have to, when you hit a FIB6 info that has a next hop object with a multipath route, you then have to walk each next hop inside of that FIB6 info. So, that's, I forget the name of the, the iterator, but I added a next hop function that basically says, um, I have a route entry that points to an external next hop. That next hop is a group. That group has X number of uh, FIB6 and H's inside of it. So give me a callback, and I'll just keep invoking that original function this many times to see if I can find whatever it is you're looking for, or to, or to make whatever change you're looking to make. So the end result is that IPv6 looks a lot more like IPv4 in the way it walks the FIB or the way it handles information. It's closer, but still some annoying differences between the two protocols. Okay, so let's leave the kernel implementation aside and look at something more user-oriented. So here's a couple of examples of how you would create a basic next hop using this new so IP route two has a new subcommand next hop, and so with IP next hop you can create so a basic a basic uh, next hop using a device and a gateway is done through one of these two commands. You could add a black hole, in which case again if you add a black hole you can add specify nothing else, or you can then create a group which is something that references the other two. Okay, so these are some you know, very simple examples of how to use this from an IP Route 2 perspective. And then you add the route pointing to it by that ID. Okay. So now let's look at what it, what it means to take a legacy command and convert that to the new API. Because a lot of the tests under self-tests, I, I took this process here and created two passes over the code, where the first one uses a legacy API for routing, and then I create a second pass which uses the new infrastructure, and it really was a matter of taking that existing command, pulling out that next hop, putting IP in front, giving it an ID, right? So doing that for each 
leg in the path or in, in the, yeah, the route, for the, the path for the route. If it's multipath, then create the group ID and then reinsert that route using the next hop ID as opposed to the expanded information. So I purposely tried to keep the syntax and the attributes as closely aligned as possible so where you can almost do a very quick replace on, on the existing code to flip from old to new. All right. So the benefits. I've already talked about um, some of reducing the processing of the already validated gateway information and device information. When you start getting into things like um, uh, MPLS and entering into a label switch path, you'll have additional overhead that comes with validating that information. Again, you can do all that stuff once and then create those references to it. The second thing it provides is that ability to get better alignment across these, these protocols, so IPv4 and IPv6, so they're not quite so different. As you start scaling, things like the memory consumption, because IPv6 had completely separate um, our FIB6 infos for each one of the data paths, or each one of the route entries in the multipath route, you start getting huge memory consumption by replicating that, that structure for each leg. With this next top information, that, that's reduced quite a bit. And then you get that better alignment with, with hardware offload. So in the case of you know, the network operating system was that driving um, use case for this, for this change. And so now you get better alignment with the end-to-end -end goal, going from BGP through the kernel down to hardware, better alignment with those objects. So this is the overlay of those graphs I presented in the executive summary. So left graph is IPv4, right side is IPv6. Blue was the legacy API. And you can see that's a huge step, uh, staircase down in performance. By having these separate objects, referencing those IDs, we get a great, a, a huge increase in performance. And then when we get that legacy code out of the way, we get that benefit of constant rate. So this is a flame graph showing legacy APIs, just kind of you know, revalidates that it was the initialization of um, that, that re redundant, the redundant gateway and, and next hop device information and allocating that data structure, allocating that memory for the cached routes and stuff. That's where the predominant overhead is when you're adding routes. Right, so the fib create info is what's processing that information. The next one over inside that circle is the fib insert. That's where you really want to be spending your time because you're adding something to the fib. So let's focus that in, you know, our overhead there. And then the RT message fib is what's sending that notification up to user space. With next hops, that fib create info is gone. And instead, your overhead is the table insert and that no, uh, user space notification. And the same goes for IPv6. It was the uh, FIB6 info create that's the huge overhead of adding routes. And with next hop APIs, that's gone. Now we're just focused on the important things, which are I'm adding something to a database, and user space wants to notify, be notified that there was something changed. So in addition to just inserting routes in the kernel, what else does this, this new API allow us to do? A common event in, in network environments is a link event causes a change in how certain prefix or prefixes are reached. So with the legacy API, if you have a multipath route and one leg goes down, FRR or BIRD or whatever has to come in and has to do a route replace on all of those routes to remove that leg that just disappeared. Right? So if you've got 10,000 routes, you have to replace 10,000 routes, or you have to delete and re-add 10,000 routes. When the prefixes are pointing to an object, a standalone object like this, you can do that update once. So instead of doing n updates, you just come in and update that next hop spec that says, well, here's the new uh, information. If it's a group, I just give a group without that one leg that disappeared. Right? So instead of n messages, it's one message. Another one that fell out of this 
was uh, RFC 5549, which is that ability to use IPv6 addresses with IPv4 routes. And it's a, the biggest need for that is something like BGP unnumbered, where you don't want to do individual addresses to have two BGPs peer, but rather, whatever that link local address is for the connection, have the BGP use that. So this piece, because of all the refactoring to get this common FIB, you know, FIB and H data structure for both V4 and V6, um, the gateway inside of that can be either a V4 or a V6, and so this kind of capability just falls out of it. So it was, it was something that I had in mind from the beginning, and as I went along, it just kind of worked where you don't even need the next hop objects to get this. You can use RTA via uh, with 5.2 and maintain your existing route API and get this V6 with V4 capability. All right, future extensions. So uh, this is a, a, a big one from what I can see from a, another NOS type environment, which is you, you've programmed your hardware with a certain configuration, right? So here's your paths for a route. And a, an event happens. And it takes time for FRR to process, or any routing daemon to process that state change, and then come back and reprogram hardware. What would be good is to have this fast rerouting, kind of an active backup next hop capability, which is you've already programmed the hardware and the kernel ahead of time that says, if this next hop goes down for any reason, immediately start using this other one. And then that'll give me time to come back and, and update the, the, uh, the specification to handle that event that just happened. So I've tried to structure the code in a way that the group, the idea of a group can be easily expanded to have an, an active backup kind of a setup. So if someone has the time to work on this, um, it really should be something you just go in and, and you know, muddle around the code of nexthop.h and nexthop.c, see how the group semantics work, see how some of those hooks that the core networking code invokes, and it should be fairly trivial to implement something like this. Status, so everything is end of the kernel today in what will be 5.3, I guess, released uh, potentially this Sunday. 5.2 contained the initial refactoring, and like I said, the IPv6 was such a, a pain and a lot of refactoring that was needed to get some commonality. So a lot of that refactoring was done in 5.2. 5.3 has the remain, remainder of that refactoring, and then it has the next top API itself. The, the code also has a large um, self-test to try to cover all different corner cases. Um, the constraints that I mentioned earlier, uh, the capabilities like V6 with V4. Um, so hopefully that, that uh, self-test um, has a, a really good uh, representation of, of what should be allowed and what shouldn't be allowed. Um, and then FRR. So the FRR guys started earlier this year, and they, I meant to update this with uh, the pull request. So they had submitted a pull request on GitHub to include this API into mainline FRR. It, the first pull request got bogged down. I don't know if it was compile failures or uh, one of the continuous integration tests was failing. Um, but that was a week or 10 days ago. It might be in there now. This initial support, it focused on correctness over performance. So we'll, what I mean by focusing on correctness over performance, there's room to improve. Uh, Performance-wise, we're seeing a benefit, but not the huge benefit that I can see with IP batch. And that was because the, the person who worked on that code was focused on the way FRR organized information. We got a huge 30% 30, 30 or more uh, reduction in, in memory. And so maybe that pendulum swung too much on the memory side, and there's some additional hash lookups that it's doing that they could probably maybe give up on some of that memory reduction to save some CPU cycles and get a better performance overhead from that. So the bottom line there is FRR is a work in progress. Initial support is there. And as with anything, you need that initial support before you can improve it and make things better. What's next? 
Um, from my perspective, I have this patch to handle the backwards compatibility. Uh, that's what I use to create the, the data. I meant to send it out, but it's really, I haven't had time to handle all the testing cases to make sure it works exactly as I want it to, to work, like the things that should be cut out are cut out. Um, I guess I should get to that so that 5.4 will be the, um, 5.4 comes out. Anyway, that it'll be out soon, although I suspect it will take some amount of time before um, all the user space um, gets, gets updated to handle this. Um, MPLS code, it would be good to get the same kind of capability into MPLS uh, routing so that they can also benefit from this kind of um, uh, performance improvements. And then someone with the time and interest uh, to, to be able to do fast rerouting. That's another really cool feature that would be good to get in. And that is all. Um, before we get to questions, uh, it seems like the turn to backwards compatibility thing off is mm -hmm. feels to me like a dump filter. So it's a capability of the listener. Um, it's a notifications. Yes, but notifications go to listeners Right, on but the notifications are a system-wide thing, and you can't have a per-process flag. So dumps could have a per-process flag, but notifications yeah, cannot. Oh, OK. Yeah. Trying to figure out just some way we can, everyone who would potentially receive these notifications could yeah. say, I really just want those NHIDs. That way, we wouldn't need right. this control thing. So the kernel, in, it's easy to make the kernel internally consistent in that regard, and mm -hmm. then you have the broadcast to the... There is a little more to it than just that. Okay. Than just expanding. So I guess, yeah, now that I look at this, I forgot my notification slide, which is, so when things happen, the idea was to create as few notifications in user space as possible. Okay. So if you, can, if you have a link event, and the kernel does things internally based on that link event, then there should not be an additional notification from any other code. So for example, carrier down on a link, the next hop code comes along and says, gone, 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 all routes using this next hop, evicted, 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 and there's no notifications for any of those, okay? So route updates is another one. Um, if someone comes along and updates that next hop ID, the specification for it, a notification is generated to user space, the backwards compatibility says I have to then walk all the all routes the that entries, refer to it exactly and send notifications. Where a backwards compatib that's a backwards compatibility thing. Once something is updated, that notification alone tells user space everything they need to know. Exactly, it's a single. So it's a little more than just. It really is a true backwards compatibility flag. Did that answer? Your For the Thank you for the detailed explanation. I, I objected to the sys control approach since I have five or six demons listening to that. I can't update them all at the same time. Yeah. However, um, do you have something that will do the allow you to do the notifica notification filtering to get it the way you want? You mean per dump? Per so dump, Per yes. application? Yes. Yeah. We could have a flag that says, I we're doing a dump. This is a specific application that wants a dump. I already understand this. Don't need to help me out. Please. In which case, you shove a lot more route messages, route entries into a single message. So yep. it makes it much I think that makes a lot of sense. Yeah. 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 Hold on to it. Hold on. So I did this hack way back in the Quagga days to, to, to <laughs> solve the problem of Quagga hearing itself talking, mm -hmm. and the kernel didn't want it, was always notifying itself about its own changes. You can actually write a small classic BPF program that says, I don't, with the socket filter, that says, I don't want X. So the problem is that you've already filled that information into the message. Right. And what but you, you save the you save the copy to user space and wake up for that so, message. Well, what you want in this case is when FRR, for example, already understands the idea of next hops, right. and it does a route dump, it doesn't need the message to contain right. the device gateway end cap. So in which case the um, I, fib dump info, whatever that function name is, it doesn't even need to walk that, that okay. code at all. So don't even put it in the message to then skip them. And so really what happens is when your route dump only contains a prefix and next hop ID, um, you can shove a lot more information into a single message. And so your, 
dump requests will happen a lot faster. I have a different question, so if you want to. Go ahead. All right. So I was wondering, uh, how do you handle um, backward compatibility on the user space side? What do you mean? How, how does yeah. FRR figure out if the kernel understands this? Like if you run the same okay. FRR code on an old kernel, or is it yes. just to compile some So scripts? you can do uh, an RTM next top, new next top dump, and if the kernel comes back and says, huh? then it doesn't understand this API. Okay, and how much overhead, like, do you know in the FRR code, like, how much, how difficult is it to support We've talked APIs? about the fact that they need a runtime switch because the same FRR has to run on both kernels, and the question's gonna be, how do they implement that? Yeah. Um, I don't know, okay. I'd have to go ask. Okay, so I, I accumulated a pile of questions because <laughs> All right. I have major issues with atomic route updates in general, and this solves some of those for me, mm -hmm. but not enough of them, but that's okay. Um, the, going backwards, how do I know the next, next hop ID? So when you start up, just like you do a route dump, mm -hmm. you would do a next hop dump. And okay, that would so give you anything that's already been configured in the kernel. You would then get that spec the, the entire history of, you know, like all the objects by ID. So and it's you not would maintain a cache if that's what you. Well, want to do. I have multiple sources of routes. I have I have RA. I have in my case the Babel daemon. Sure. I have uh, other stuff. So the IDs are sequential and, and in totally in their own space, or are yep. they per scope? I mean per protocol. So now what you're saying is something different. This gets into user space daemons. So when I showed that hybrid NOS architecture where you could have multiple coming into a fib. That's kind of like what FRR has with Zebra is the FIB process. And you could have OSPF or BGP or RIP or these other daemons running. And they send all that information to Zebra. And Zebra has to say, well, I'm only going to send certain things down to the kernel. Let me create a unique next hop. I'll assign my ID to it. Because the kernel is just a dummy database, right? It doesn't do any kind of logic like that. And FRR consolidates that, says, here's my set of unique next hops, shoves that information to the kernel and then puts those prefixes into the kernel referencing those IDs. I get so that. That's a user space problem, not a yes. kernel problem. Well, it's a monolithic number space, and I usually have five it, or six daemons conflicting space, with each other. And that's because the routes themselves, when you go to reference a route, you would insert that route, you'd have an ID pointing to an object. And so what, what gets created is, like I said, a struct next top star points to the actual object. So you can't have two with the same ID. The problem right. is if the so user space there is a, are not hold on, coordinating. One, one second. Um, there is a protocol attribute so that you can say, here, here's the list of next hops created by Zebra, for example. Right. So you can do protocol okay. listings, but not, not by ID. Like the ID itself is still universal for that network namespace. The long-standing bug I've been dealing with is you can't do a route replace that's specific to the protocol. Uh, um, in IPv6. Okay. Hold, hold on. Different. Go ahead, Toki. Yeah, or, yeah. The, I think also the problem here is if, the, if you have two user space demons that are not coordinating, yes. do they just like grab a range of IDs and say, I'm going to use these? Or, like, how, don't they, what if they step on each other's toes? Sh sure, that, that is possible. And they'll have to figure out if that next top ID is already in use. Right? So what I would expect is that these demons at least would do a dump and they would see what already exists. Because if that specification already exists, again, typically there's only so many egress devices, there's only so many next hops, you know, individual how, how next hops. How big is the ID field? I'm sorry? How many bits is the ID field? 32, U32. Yeah. Okay. So you were asking about V6 replace. Yes, that is a known pain point for multi-path routes. Could we have a next hop uh, via a MAC address instead of uh, via some sort of IP address? That would be an easy extension, I think, the way this is set up, because ultimately that's what you care about from a hardware perspective. Um, but what you're doing is bypassing um, neighbor discovery as well. So the network address, it being a network entry and a network address, and that gets resolved to then a link address. Um, to bypass that and go straight to this prefix uses this Mac, I mean, you could, software could do anything, right? David, uh, for the backward com compat stuff, mm -hmm. would it be cheaper to introduce another group? Another? Route group, Multicast group. Uh, Your group, so only listeners listening. Um, 
So this gets into the route notifications, not the next hop notifications. Yes. And so now, now what you're saying is send a message twice. And I think what you would see is there's a huge performance hit to doing to something do twice. twice. So even if there are no listeners on the... But see, the, do we the create notification code that generates the message it, has no idea that there's no listeners. That's actually something I would like to see. Like okay. some kind of way of tracking that says nobody cares, don't even generate don't the message. Don't even generate. So uh, you've shown the performance improvements on the uh, route uh, insertion. Mm -hmm. uh, what if, does it have any effect on route lookup? On route lookup. Uh, on route lookup. Yeah. Uh, no measurable performance on my end. So it, uh, there theoretically should be some small amount, but the testing that I've done, and it was a performance benchmark that I think Dave started years back that Benson Burnett made some changes when he did his blog posts. And then I took that and made some simplifications. And when I was running those, um, you know, the performance variation run to run was like the changes to this next hop was within that performance variation that I see run to run. So it's, it, it, there probably is some small amount, but it seems to be in the noise overall. You're talking about route bench, right? RT bench or whatever um, I called yeah. it. Yeah. Route bench, yeah. Yes. Okay, hey, we're way past and to respect the next uh, presenter. We think that's the last question. Thank you very okay. much, David. You know where to find me. <laughs>